What's up? How are we doing? I am David Long, here to talk with you guys today about a criticism I received from Keith Price about my integral epistemology video. This video came out in 2015. It's actually one of the first philosophy videos I made. Seems like a good place to start, and I hadn't really presented my epistemology before yet, so I was excited to put it together and present it. And it really does all start with epistemology. In fact, I invited Keith to check out my epistemology because I think it's foundational. And Keith, thank you for doing the work and for putting a critique together and for doing it in public. I appreciate that. I'm not one of these guys who demonizes or runs from my critics. I'm happy to do philosophy. I'm happy to do philosophy in public. I would prefer these criticisms be in public. I think it's a great chance for us all to learn not only more about epistemology, but about civil discourse and skillful dialogue. I'm all for the practice of philosophy. I think it's good. I think it helps everybody. And so thank you, Keith, and thank you everybody who honestly engages in this topic. Keith and I have argued before in integral groups on Facebook. So Keith is an idealist. He says he's writing a book called The End of Materialism. And this is probably the real root of our conflict. He's an idealist and I'm an emergentist. Some people are like, what do these things mean? Well, idealists think that the world is arising in mind or in consciousness. Like, fundamentally, all there really is is mind or consciousness or spirit or God or something like that. And on a realist view, consciousness arises or emerges out of matter. Consciousness, as we know it, is an emergent property of reality. So what it really comes down to is nesting. Are the interiors nested in the exteriors, like a realist perspective, or are the exteriors nested in the interiors, like an idealistic perspective? There are several variations on both of these themes, a bunch of different ways to be idealist, and a bunch of different ways to be a realist. So Keith is one of these guys who is a fan of Rupert Sheldrake and believes in psychic powers. So that's some of the kind of green new age woo-woo and pseudoscience that he brings with him into integral and he thinks this stuff is valid and justified in part because Wilbur does as well. But these issues are probably going to be at the root of the disagreements I have with Keith here because he's going to ultimately straw man science, downplay objectivity, and uplift phenomenology to make it seem more good or reasonable. And that makes sense because if you think that the world doesn't really exist except for in your mind, you're going to be like objectivity doesn't really matter that much and phenomenology is what really gets us at any kind of truth. This is going to be your perspective. So these are going to be probably at the heart of his criticisms around what I'm talking about. Things to keep in mind. There really aren't gaps big enough to try to sneak some of these gods in that they want to sneak in. We should really know better, especially at integral stages. I have an idea about something that I think it would be interesting to try. I'm going to go ahead and number each point I wish I stopped to talk so people who are following along can reference sections of the talk in the comment or sections of my reply in the comment. I'm also going to keep a tracker of of points against me and fallacies. And that should be interesting. We'll see where it goes. And if you come up with your own count or you think that I got something wrong, let me know. So I'm just gonna go ahead and jump into the critique. I think we set it up pretty well. So I'm gonna read the parts that he says. And if you go to the post in Integral Global, you can follow along. I'm just gonna go straight down the thing and deal with his points one by one. So the first thing he says is, critique of David Long's integral epistemology. I have decided that a detailed investigation of the philosophical biases of David Long sustained attacks on Wilbur and many others on this site is long overdue. So on this first point, I'm very tempted to call straw man right away because he says I have a philosophical bias, but he doesn't really demonstrate that in this talk. And he talks about my sustained attacks on Wilbur. So what he's doing here is a detailed investigation and an exposing of my biases which we'll have to see if at the end you feel like a bias of mine has been exposed. Maybe we could return to this initial claim. But when I am critical of Wilbur and talk about his biases, that's an attack. So this wording isn't very gracious, doesn't start from a place of assuming goodwill. Basically what he's saying here is that I'm talking a bunch of trash and that he's going to put me in my place. I'm shaking in my boots. Let's see if he puts me in my place. He certainly doesn't deal with any of my criticisms of Wilbur in this video. It definitely feels like a straw man. It's an empty claim or assertion backed up by nothing. 
in the beginning of this talk. And if anything, I think in general, in the beginning of a talk, if you're trying to establish goodwill with an interlocutor, you probably want to start by saying some good things. If you have anything gracious to say or any kind of way of letting people know that you see any kind of positivity in the context, usually in the beginning of a criticism like this is the place where that kind of stuff happens. Like, for example, the first video of my What You Talking About Wilbur series is basically me starting from saying all the good things about him and all the ways that I've benefited from learning from him. And what you'll find in what follows is not personal attacks or insults. What you'll find is an honest look to see if Wilbur's ideas actually stand up to his own standards and methodology. And judge for yourself. I would invite anybody to deal with those points. So kind of a straw man, not a great way to start in terms of seeming fair or balanced or setting it up in a way that wants to frame me as possibly an honest or open person. Basically, this opening sentence starts by being like, here's this guy. He talks a bunch of trash and attacks Wilbur and getting his ass kicked is long overdue. And I I'm about to step up and do that. So not a very charitable framing. Usually integralists are about trying to see pros and cons, even if they don't like a person. But here we have an attempt at a takedown, and he calls that a detailed investigation, while my criticisms against Wilbur are attacks. So this is a double standard and a straw man, and not a great way to start a talk. Unfortunately, you don't really get any of my criticisms of Wilbur dealt with in this video. If you want to deal with my criticisms around Wilbur, you should check out my Davidian versus Wilburian AQAL videos or my What You Talking About Wilbur videos and deal with the points there. This is about epistemology and when it comes to epistemology, Wilbur and I pretty much agree. We have the same methodology, the same standards. I think where we disagree is in the application of those things. I don't think he's as true to his standards as I would want to be. But I agree. I think this kind of a talk in our community is long overdue and if I have some kind of philosophical biases, let's explore that and see what it is. I'm totally open open to be criticized in public, and if somebody makes good points against me that I think are true, and if I think that there's a better way to go about doing that and I can be convinced of that, I'd be happy to change my mind and thank anybody who can do that for me. Let's include a quick explanation of the straw man fallacy for those of you who don't know, just because the straw man fallacy comes up so many times in this video. We're moving on now to fallacies that involve what I called violations of the rules of rational argumentation. The rules in question are things like being able and willing to reason well, not being willing to lie or distort things simply to win an argument and so on. The first fallacy of this type that we'll look at is more commonly known as the straw man fallacy. The name comes from the practice of using human figures made of straw as practice dummies in military training. Obviously, it's easier and safer to practice certain combat techniques when your opponent is made of straw. The fallacy works like this. Alice offers an argument to Bob. She wants to convince him of something. Let's say that Alice's argument is really pretty strong, like this boxer. Bob isn't sure he can handle this argument. So instead of trying to refute Alice's actual argument, Bob decides to engage a different argument. He decides to engage this straw figure. What is the straw figure? It's a weaker, distorted version of Alice's original argument. Because it's weaker, Bob is easily able to refute the straw figure argument. The straw figure fallacy is complete when Bob does the dance of joy and claims that he has successfully refuted Alice's original argument. But of course, Bob hasn't refuted the original argument, he's only refuted a distorted misrepresentation of it. This is the straw figure or straw man fallacy. This fallacy is often categorized as a fallacy of relevance because the attacks made on the weak straw figure are irrelevant to judging the actual strengths and weaknesses of the original argument. And this is correct, but I prefer to think of it as a violation of the rules of rational argumentation, especially when it involves knowingly and willfully misrepresenting an argument. When someone is willing to do this, they're no longer playing by the rules. They're more concerned with the appearance of winning than with argumentation itself. When you see this going on, you should try to correct the misrepresentation and get the discussion back on track. If it's an honest mistake and the arguer is willing to correct their misunderstanding, that's great. But if you catch them doing this again and again, then there's probably no point in engaging argumentatively with this person, because they've shown you that they're not willing to play by the rules. So let's get into the next sentence. As David himself pointed me to a YouTube video of his from 2015, he shares a link. As expressed in his epistemology, I have carefully reviewed the video and now present my findings. It is, of course, possible that David has since refined or corrected his views, but he is happy to let it stand I process on that basis. This is a thoughtful framing. This is actually my favorite part of his whole talk. The part where he says, it's possible that I have since refined or corrected my views because there are ways in which I have refined my views. And I'm glad to be able to talk about that a little bit today. And this does inspire me to want to make an upgraded video. When I first made this video, I was just getting started and I was still kind of trying to figure out who I was talking to. So to me, this is like a layperson video about philosophy. This isn't like an academic philosophy video. This is a philosophy video for regular people about truth, trying 
trying to simplify for them. This is for people late orange to green to early integral, people who are learning. This isn't a philosophical presentation or for a peer-reviewed journal or something like that, as he says later. But I do appreciate this openness to growth. That's my favorite part of his critique. I think that's the most generous and thoughtful bit, and it really does make me feel like there is some sincerity and good faith as a starting off point. Unfortunately, I feel like a lot of it's going to be downhill from here, but I like that bit. So the next thing he says is, my verdict is that the material is deeply flawed and cannot be the basis of any serious philosophical critique, I'm afraid. And then he offers the details. So again, he ends up fighting a straw man. Wilbur and I agree about the methodology, and he doesn't actually make any points against me that I disagree with. So this is going to be mostly uneventful, me just telling him that he's misunderstanding me for the most part. But we'll dive into it more. Also, this is not a critique of Wilbur. When I critique Wilbur, it's based on integral standards. This is just a video about different types of truth. I think in general, what he's saying here has to be somewhat divorced from my specific criticisms of Wilbur's points. Unless he can directly show how one affects the other, but we don't see that, we only see this idea of, oh, I think David gets it wrong in some ways in his epistemology, therefore we should dismiss everything he says. And that's not really a reasonable way to go, especially when I didn't really get it wrong and he's just fighting a straw man. Okay, I'm going to keep reading what he says. He says, he, meaning me, starts with a four-quadrant scheme of his own devising, which has factual truth and falsity across the top and things not known and things unknowable across the bottom. It's just a useful tool to get a perspective on a thing. There's things that you know to be true and things that we know are not true and then things that are unknown that we could still discover and then things that are unknown that we could never discover. And what would it mean to discover something and what does it mean that something is known? How do we know? Based on evidence. Evidence is a very vague word here and for a reason. What happens is he immediately assumes that when I say evidence, I mean empirical evidence, which is not the case, but I will continue on. He says there are multiple problems with this categorization. The first is that he conflates fact with objective fact, ascertaining by measurement. The idea is that facts are true for everyone, objective science based on measurement, to take out the subjective element of personal experience so that way we can get an actual measurable thing that would be true for everyone, no matter who had certain experience with a certain type of thing. Subjective truth is apparently not factual. Okay, this actually is one of the places, there are a few places in this where it does seem like he quotes me. So it's not all just no quotes, but I never said subjective truth is not factual. See, and this is where I think he's confusing truth and fact. Fact is a thing that can be known or proven to be true. It's an established truth. Something we know is true is a fact, and it becomes a fact because it's been put through some process of verification, either logic or evidence of some kind. So for example, you could report your subjective experience, and it might seem true to you, but that doesn't mean that it was objectively true. It might be true that that was what you experienced. So you could be being truthful or being honest and also get it wrong. And you could be telling me that something is true and you could be lying. So unless I verify that what you're saying to me is true, it's not a fact. It's just your phenomenological report. So there's a difference between factual and true. But yes, there are certainly subjective facts and intersubjective facts and objective facts. So the problem is that he's assuming what I think and trying to make it seem like I'm saying that. He's almost like pushing me into a straw man here so that way he can knock it down. And again, these aren't direct quotes of what I said. The quote he has is that the point of science is to come up with facts that are true to everyone and to eliminate the subjective element of personal experience so we can actually get at the objective truth of the thing. And yeah, we do that through some kind of measurement or through some kind of peer review and validation. You know, like, I see that. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? And if everybody's seeing it, then it must be real. And the reason that we have that is because for a long time, we were relying on our subjective experiences and people were confused. This is why with science and rationality, there were huge upgrades in knowledge and it changed the world forever because what we had before wasn't as good or reliable. I'm going to continue. So here he certainly has in his mind the relativistic notion that my ideas about reality are as good as yours just because they are mine. This, however, is to totally mistake what subjective truths are. No, that's just one example of a subjective truth. Your subjective truth could just be your experience, whatever that might be. So again, he's fighting a straw man. These are where some quotes would probably come in handy too. Quotes, 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 quotes. Everybody. 
Listen up. If you want to never be accused of a straw man, there are two things that you can do to achieve this. The first thing is quote the person. Don't put words in their mouth. Don't tell them what they're saying. Quote them. This forces you to respond to what they're actually saying, not to jump to conclusions based on what they're saying. If you're not sure that they're specifically and explicitly saying a certain thing that you can actually quote them saying, then you shouldn't be jumping to conclusions to put words in their mouth. The better way to go about doing this is to ask a question. Like, for example, if you did think that they were trying to imply some kind of ideology or reductionism or something like that, all you have to do is say, are you trying to imply that this and this and this? Because then you can be wrong and it can be like, oh, my bad. I didn't know you were not trying to imply that. That's why I asked. So quoting the person, asking a question, you can still include your criticisms and frame it in a way that asks it as a question. And then if you're wrong, it's just like, oh, well, I guess I was confused as opposed to trying to tell the other person what they think or put words in their mouth or make assumptions and jump to conclusions. It's not a good way to go. Notice in almost any critical thing that I do, I always try to quote the person. The best is when you can get actual video or audio of them saying it. But even here, notice that I'm reading it out and I'll also provide a link to it. I don't want to be straw manning. I want to quote him and deal with what he said. And if somebody thinks that I misunderstood him, they can let me know. But I'm going to attempt to avoid that kind of stuff. Okay, so next point. To take his own example, a Christian is upset by a demonstration of the fact of evolution. That is his subjective truth, that he is upset. Indeed, but that is also a fact. Objective rightness or wrongness of his belief does not come into it. And this is where it would be good to know what a fact means. The definition of a fact is a thing that is known or proven to be true. So while a person's subjective experience might be true, or it might be true that they're having this experience, that doesn't make it a fact. It's not a fact until you prove or demonstrate that it's true. So in terms of a critique of epistemology, knowing the difference between truth and fact is actually a pretty important distinction. If you don't know what a fact is, I don't know how you can then go on to make claims like you understand science. Knowing the difference between fact and truth turns out to be a pretty important distinction. Okay, here we go again. The notion of a fact is a very general one. All sorts of things are facts, whether physical or mental, subjective, objective, intersubjective, or indeed interobjective, or any other category there may be. To restrict it to objective facts is an utterly untenable restriction. Curiously, later in the video, he seems to realize this, but does nothing to correct his earlier error. Well, first of all, he never quotes me in making this error. He's fighting his own assertion and straw man. Where's the sentence where I said something about facts here? I spoke about evidence, and I've spoken about truth. I don't even think I mentioned facts. The error here is that Keith doesn't know what a fact is. He's confusing fact and truth. And really all this comes back to the idea of me being a empirical reductionist and a materialist because that suits his narrative. So he's going to try to push me into that position so that way he can kill that and say that I'm not integral. This actually reminds me a lot of how Christians will often tell atheists that they're rebellious children. So like they don't see the distinction between red and orange. So you have this Christian at blue who thinks that anybody who doesn't want to be a Christian is just a red rebellious child who won't step up. They don't see the orange rationality is actually more mature. All they see is rebellious children. That's a type of pre-trans fallacy number one. And so we have this problem around the green pre-trans fallacy around integral stages. People who have this more green worldview, integral as green on steroids that Don Beck criticizes, they tend to want to reduce the emergentist integralists to materialist reductionists. Wilbur does this all the time too. He's always strawmanning scientists as if all scientists don't believe in interiority and are all just empirical reductionists. It's like they don't recognize emergentism, and so all realism is just simplistic materialism. It's really unskillful, and basically it just turns out that these people, whenever it comes to the topic of real science, they just bring out their straw man dummy and start trying to cut him down. So I think the facts against truth thing is a point for me. Another straw man is a fallacy against him. 
And I'm going to throw on a pre-trans fallacy on there as well, because he wants to try to reduce an emergentist perspective to an empirical reductionist perspective. You know, I'm looking through some of the comments on his post in Integral Global, and it's not pretty. I said something about wishing he would have quoted me or put some timestamps or something so it would be easier to reference, kind of like how I'm doing here. But he's sure he didn't strawman me or misrepresent me. In the comments, we get things like, poor orange David. Oh, I'm orange, am I? Nice. Very nice. This is a freshman use of spiral dynamics. It's that violent and unskillful use where you try to reduce a person to a stage of development. It's one thing to say that Keith has some green new age ideas. He could drop those ideas. He could outgrow those bad ideas. But I never said Keith himself is green. That's just unskillful. And we don't do that. I don't think Keith is a bad guy. I mean, I definitely think he's fighting his shadow and fighting a straw man and that his philosophy isn't good, which isn't to say that it's not supported by some smart people from philosophy history, but it doesn't really stand up to the times. It doesn't stand up to the evidence. And there's a reason why we're at a point in our history where certain theories get favored by the majority of the scientific community. And it's not politics or some bullish. It's because those theories actually have the best better explanatory power. All right, let's go to the next one. The next problem is that he conflates fact with literal fact. Not only must a fact be an objective fact, but it must also be literal, as opposed to metaphorical, parabolic, and so on. Thus, story, fable, parable, myth, and so on end up being false because not literally true. No, they're literally false. So again, there's no quote here, and because he still confuses truth and fact, he just ends up fighting a straw man. So of course, stories that are factually wrong can be metaphorically true, which is the point I'm trying to make in bringing it up. And of course that these metaphors, if unpacked and qualified, can also be factually true, which is the reason I bring it up. So he seems to miss the point completely and go off fighting a straw man. So there's a lot of straw manning happening and it's because there's no quotes and the quotes that he does share don't say the thing that he's accusing me of saying. And also if these things were phrased as a question, then he'd be safe. But he's making a claim about what I think and he ends up being wrong and so it's a straw man. If you've been arguing and doing philosophy for long enough, these are skills that you should have. At a certain point, hopefully you get experienced enough not to fall into these traps. And Keith here falls into it over and over and over again. This is like freshman philosophy stuff. Good philosophers know how to make good points and make those points land. Or at least question something in a way that if their understanding of the thing is true, it's going to be potentially devastating. And if they are misunderstood, they can be easily corrected without seeming like they're making unfounded accusations about what another person thinks. If you want to do philosophy skillfully, quote the person, ask questions. A question can be just as devastating as a statement. They do have the function, however, of creating or pointing to meaning. This is a gross misrepresentation of these various literary forms. Let us take the example he gives, that of the fable of the hare and the tortoise. Here, the clear meaning of the story, the critical importance of perseverance is the relevant fact. The other fact that no one supposes that there was ever an actual hare and tortoise race is described in the story is utterly besides the point and gives no warrant for calling the story false in the way a deliberate lie is. Moreover, many stories, the point of which is the importance of moral and character traits and so on, are in fact literally true. So we have to conclude that the meaning stories cannot be categorized in this way. This is the point of making literal and metaphorical distinctions. This is the point of being able to analyze things on this level, to be able to be like, are we talking literally here or metaphorically? Because a story can be literally true, like there are facts in a biopic, there are true myths, and then stories can be factually false, made up, not true, not real, like the tortoise and the hare. And there are reasons to go to stories like the tortoise and the hare, because if you bring up stories of Jesus or Buddha, those are more controversial stories. But stories like the tortoise and the hare are well-known stories that are well-established as fiction. There's not like cults around them and stuff. So it's a safe example. So when it comes to a mythology around someone like Jesus or Buddha or something like that, we want to be able to say, okay, yes, 
this is metaphorically true, but is it historically true? We want to be able to separate out these different kinds of truths and to understand that something can be metaphorically true, regardless of whether it's historically true or not, and to understand that those are different questions. And to prove that something is historically or literally true is going to take a different validation process than deciding whether it's metaphorically true. So it seems like Keith actually misses the point completely of what it is to make these distinctions, be it literal or metaphorical or true versus fact or subjective versus objective. Like the whole point of this epistemology is to set up these distinctions so that way we can be more nuanced and clear. I've never seen a person miss the point like this in this way. So it's interesting to me that he can watch this and come to these conclusions when it's so clear that the points that he's trying to make are points that I'm making. Like there's, again, there's no quote here where I'm saying something that's wrong and he's like, see, this is where he says it. You don't see that. You just see him asserting that I'm saying something that I'm clearly not saying. All right, back to it. He says, thus we already have enough warrant to reject this quadrant scheme. I mean, so far all we have here is him fighting a straw man and totally missing the point and being wrong about what the distinctions are. I mean, it would be totally reasonable, I would think, at this point to be like, well, look, that's enough said. We've read enough. Here we are at point 10, and all we've seen are fallacies and straw men and missing the point, and it doesn't really get better from here. So I will continue and do all of it, but if we're just gonna be rejecting people based on a little bit of what we've seen of them and what they've put on the table, maybe we should just be done with Keith after this, right? Because he has demonstrated pretty clearly here that he's not really that honest or gracious of an interlocutor. He's happy to straw man people, and he's kind of a fallacy machine. Let's continue though, shall we? Something must also be said, however, about the idea that all of this turns on evidence. Nothing is said in the video about what type or types of evidence are to decide where something falls in the quadrants, but I think we are safe to say that David has empirical evidence in mind. This is where he goes wrong. This is where he really reveals his bias, is that he really wants to think that I am an empirical reductionist, that I'm one of these materialists that he likes to straw man. And I clearly do explain that there's different evidence in different quadrants when I later introduce integral methodological pluralism. And that's the reason it's ambiguous at this point as to what counts as evidence, because I'm getting to that. And I didn't want to try to unpack all of that at that point. I was building up to it. So it's wrong. Something is said in this video about what kind of evidence and what kind of quadrants. And again, it's just hammering the bell of that same straw man fallacy over and over again. All right, let's go to the next one. That he indicates that this quadrant is supposed to fit neatly on the top of the upper right quadrant of the integral four quadrant model confirms this. Okay, let me unpack this a little bit. So integral methodological pluralism talks about zones, which is basically duality within the quadrant. So there's an inside and outside view in each quadrant. What I'm basically exploring is quadrants within quadrants. And I'm thinking about this idea where we talk about the good, the true, and the beautiful, right? And it's like, the beautiful is subjective, the good is relative, and the true is objective. And so if we're talking about truth, that's what epistemology is looking at. And of course, it's not upper right quadrant reductionist because it explores truth in all quadrants. It's quadrants within quadrants. It's not just that quadrant. <laughs> Integral methodological pluralism is exploring all quadrants. It's an all quadrant approach to truth. And if we look in the other quadrants, right, there's a four quadrant approach to spiritual practice. I have a four S's of integral spiritual practice video that I made that explores spirituality in all four quadrants. And here very soon, if not right around the time that this video comes out, I have a talk on the integral stage with Michael Dowd and several others about religious naturalism. And I explore a four quadrant approach to religion and spirituality. I think also we can have something like this in the lower left quadrant where we have a four quadrant analysis of morality and ethics, something like deontology and consequentialism and utilitarianism and Aristotelian virtue ethics. And these things can all potentially fit into different quadrants and we can have a four quadrant approach to morality. And I think there could also be something like a four quadrant approach to systems theory or to governance or something in the lower right quadrant. I haven't personally fleshed that out yet, although this 
talk right now is kind of inspiring me to want to do that. And so that's what I mean by saying that looking at these four quadrants in epistemology is like four quadrants within the upper right quadrant. So that doesn't imply empirical reductionism. Instead of just being like, oh, that's truth. Oh, that's beauty. Oh, that's morality. Oh, that's politics. There's quadrants within quadrants. It's very important to point out that this is very far from being the only kind of evidence that exists. In fact, it is not even the most certain. To take one of the most well-known examples that I am conscious is conclusive evidence that I exist. And many, many other mental facts are immediately and indubitably known. Thus, to tactically insist that evidence lives just in the upper right of the four quadrants is to seriously misrepresent the actual epistemological situation. Again, this is fighting a straw man. I introduce integral methodological pluralism in this video, which takes into account zones and different methodologies and different approaches to knowledge in all four quadrants. Don't fight a straw man, kids. You waste a lot of time and your opponent's just going to be standing there like, okay. That's not even what I'm saying. Related to the last point is another important reason why this scheme will not fly, which is that objectivity is not just about objective facts, and it treats it as if it is. Being objective is about being able to take an objective perspective on whatever you are aware of, and that does not have to be something in the objective world. So, for example, if I am experiencing anger, I might be completely or largely subject to it and act it out, or I may be largely objective about it by taking an observer stance to it and thus be more able to choose a more considered response to the situation in which my anger arose. Moreover, the integral chart that David shows at the end of the video, which shows different disciplines possible by taking different perspectives on each of the four quadrants illustrates that objectively is obtainable in many different ways depending on what you're observing. Exactly. Right. I show this chart at the end. It's a straw man. And so this is where because you've gotten a premise wrong, you come to wrong conclusions. Given all this, we find no reason either to divide things unknown into those we don't yet have sufficient empirical evidence for and those that are perpetually mysterious. More especially as the claim that something we can never know about must also in some important sense be literally false can be clearly seen to have no warrant. How could we ever know such a thing in principle? The entire categorization must be thrown out as utterly misconceived. That ought to be enough. There is more, however. Your entire understanding of what I'm saying should be thrown out as utterly misconceived or misconstrued. There's not really a quote here where he's saying that I'm saying something, and I mention evidence but not necessarily empirical evidence, though I say that there needs to be some form of measurement, but all of the different methodologies to get data from all the different quadrants are some form of measurement, not just empirical, and yes, even phenomenological sense data like of your own experience and using logic along with it includes in part a form of measurement. My position is that if you are claiming to know things beyond that which we can actually know, it's an unfounded claim and it's unreasonable to believe it. And that doesn't necessarily make it false. But if you have no good reasons to believe something, you shouldn't believe it. So this is confusing different questions and missing the point, which is that you have to have good reasons and evidence to say that you know things or make claims and that there are different types of truth. He reads in empirical reductionism because it suits his narrative. Also, it's important to know that different methodologies have more reliability than others. Different types of truth are more reliable than others. It's important to know the different strengths and limitations of each of these methodologies. And it's important to know that there are limits on our knowledge in general. And this is the reason to consider the unknowable and how we might know things. This is actually a pretty good place to start, it seems to me. It's like, what can we say that we know and how can we say that we know it? And basically, it's like we know things because there's some kind of evidence to suggest that it's true. So reasons to know things, reasons for believing in things. This is the foundation of good knowledge. And this is probably part of why he's having problems with all this stuff is because he probably isn't building his ideas on good reasons to believe things. He probably is more like making a case for the kinds of ideas that he likes to believe. And this is pretty fundamental. Not that long ago, I released a Davidian integral map based on an emergentist view and a video about my differences with Wilbur. I'm gonna continue to work to upgrade it and update it. And one of the things that has been added or that will be added to the next version of it is gonna be this nested quadratic holarchies. So on the other side of this idea of tetra arising, once you kind of deconstruct that as a claim about cosmology, what we see is that the quadrants are nested within each 
each other. But the nesting goes in different ways depending on the subject or what we're talking about. So one of these nested quadratic holarchies has to do with accuracy. And we know that the data in some quadrants is more accurate and useful and helpful than others. And what tends to happen is that people end up overvaluing the least reliable types of data and undervaluing the most reliable types of data. So people try to undervalue science, which has the most accuracy, and they over glorify personal experience, which is the least accurate. So, of course, when it comes to knowing what a person actually thinks or feels, phenomenology is the best approach to get at that first person data. So in that realm, to get at that data, first person experience is the best you can get. But first person experience is notoriously untrustworthy, which is why science was developed. And it's like one of the major things that you learn through studying psychology. There are so many ways in which our perception is incredibly limited and flawed. Remember when this controversy over whether a dress was blue or white and gold blew up the internet and basically started fights with couples all over the world. This is people disagreeing over the color of a picture of a dress. Have you seen this test that they do where they tell you to count the times that basketballs are passed and at the end it's revealed that a dude in a gorilla suit walks across the screen and bangs his chest and walks through and most people don't see it because they're so focused on the passing of the ball. The camera caught it all. The camera has an objective perspective on the events. The person has an incredibly limited perspective. It's totally caught up in whatever they're focusing on and whatever their conditioning is. And even then, memory is terrible and unreliable. So the scope at which subjectivity brings accuracy and the amount of accuracy that it brings is the most limited in terms of any kinds of methodology. There are areas in which it's the expert, but it's not reliable and definitely not a good way to get knowledge about the world that we live in. So people have this idea like, you can just experience things in a pure way. And that's just not how experience works. We experience things through the filters and the frames we come to a thing with. Like, for example, if we're integral, we're going to take an integral approach to it. I mean, you're going to take some kind of an approach to it. The best approach you can take to it is an integral approach to it, because then you're going to at least be systematically checking through different perspectives, whereas most people would just take a reductionist perspective to it. What does astrology have to say about this? What does the Bible say about this? But there's no escaping the fact that we have a limited and highly conditioned perspective. That's how we're able to make distinctions and see things, is that we have maps in our mind that allow us to contextualize the territory and to the extent to which we have maps for things is the extent to which we can describe the territory. If we don't have a word for it, you're unlikely to be able to see something for what it is. If we do have a word for it, you're going to be seeing it through a culturally conditioned perspective. So the example that he gives about how personal experience can be a greater form of knowledge is he talks about knowing that we exist. This might be the only place in which this kind of phenomenology is really the most superior tool. Besides knowing what a person and feelings besides knowing that you exist as a baseline for reality. In what other way could it be said that phenomenology is a more superior methodology to get at truth? So he has this idea like witnessing his emotions and not being subject to them makes him objective. It doesn't at all make him objective. The reason he thinks it's good to disidentify with his emotions and witness them instead of experiencing them is because he has conditioning that tells him that that's a good thing to do. That's not objective. That's a highly conditioned response. And a lot of this goes back to this idea of naive realism or taking your experience as a given without realizing that it's heavily conditioned, bottom up through nature, top down through nurture. But part of the way that people want to frame their experiences as if they just experience what is in a pure way with no conditioning, that their experience is trustworthy, that they saw what is and that's what's true because they know because their experience. In philosophy of mind, naive realism also also known as direct realism, common sense realism, or perceptual realism, is the idea that senses provide us with direct awareness of objects as they really are. Objects obey laws of physics and retain their properties whether or not there is anyone to observe them. They are composed of matter, occupy space, have properties such as size, shape, blah blah blah. So in philosophy, actually, naive realism is the idea that the senses provide us with direct awareness of objects as they really are, or that whatever we're perceiving 
perceiving, we're perceiving in some kind of pure way. And because Keith is not a realist, I don't think he can really be a naive realist. So maybe he's just naive? I'm gonna go with that. If you think you just perceive what is in some kind of pure way, if you think that your subjective experience is of the absolute truth, you're naive. Part of integral theory is this idea of the Wilbur Combs matrix or the Wilbur Combs lattice. And the idea is that we always understand any idea from whatever stage of development that we're at. Whatever our translation of any experience says more about us and our stage of development than it does about the actual truth of reality. Combine these few ideas together, that phenomenology is actually a superior way to get at truth. That witnessing something means that you have an objective perspective on it and a lack of a distinction between truth and facts. And you have a pretty nice recipe for some pseudoscience, some woo-woo, some justifying personal experience around these particular combinations of things. It's exactly what I was saying up front. It's the downplaying of science, the downplaying of objective truth, and the overglorification of phenomenology and personal experience. So I do need to make a video about these nested quadratic holarchies and unpack what that's about a little bit more. That's really interesting stuff. I do have a little bit of a talk about it on my states talk on the integral stage, and I have a clip of my part of that talk on my YouTube page as well if you want to check it out. Link in the description. Back to it. The video goes on at length about the lower left or we quadrant having a function of a filter. I cannot regard this take on it as accurate or illuminating. The lower left is the home of facts that are the result of intersubjective understanding and agreement, such as language, shared values, cultural ideas, and so on. David describes this as relative truth that has to do with meaning. According to him, everything is filtered through this relative truth meaning, even 2 plus 2 equals 4. He further explains, everything that we know has been communicated to us by some person in the objective reality. So we get, coming this way, sense information, this expands our perspective, then we express and project from that, which defines our experience, so we have incredibly limited perspectives. Furthermore, everything we know is based on our experience of the objective reality, except that it's a circle determined by our previous communications through our culture. He refers to this as the hermeneutic circle. Lots to unpack in there. Basically, yes, in this part, I'm talking about how objective, subjective, and relative aspects of our experience relate to each other in this kind of a circular way, where there's objective reality out there, our subjective experience in here, and a relative filter of meaning and values that colors our experience on the way in, and that we end up projecting onto reality on the, on the other side, right? So this is this projection and assimilation cycle. And I refer to it as the hermeneutic circle because as a younger philosopher, you generally assume that especially around things like this, that you would end up reinventing the wheel. Like someone has definitely already talked about this, right? And a friend of mine mentioned to me that it reminded them of the hermeneutic circle. I looked up the hermeneutic circle and I was like, yeah, this is similar. You know, very similar to that. But it's not really exactly the hermeneutic circle. The hermeneutic circle is when you interpret a word or a sentence in the light of the larger paragraph or chapter or book and how they inform each other. This is very similar to that. So yeah, years later, I'm older, I'm going to claim credit. I don't think anyone has talked about it this kind of way. It's the assimilation and projection cycle. And notice underneath what it says, the perspective expansion process, right? So I'm talking about the expansion of perspective. This isn't just a limit. Ultimately, it helps to expand your perspective. I even share a bit at the bottom that talks about possible reactions to experience and how I think that perspectives will expand over time given proper pressure. And I'm proud of this. I think it actually makes sense to a lot of people and it's pretty helpful. So he says that the video goes on at length about the lower left quadrant having a function of a filter and he says he cannot regard this take on it as accurate or illuminating. So he says accurate or illuminating. Illuminating seems to imply that it's not really telling us anything new, but accurate seems to imply like he doesn't think it's true. So I don't know 
what he's actually saying. In this paragraph, at least, he doesn't say what's inaccurate about it, but maybe we'll get to that further down. If he doesn't think that culture or relative meanings affect the way that we understand and see reality, that's going to be very interesting. But it would make sense from this kind of naive perspective. It's an over-glorification of the subjective and a downplaying of the fact that he's translating his experience in the context of relative meaning matrices. Maybe he's denying this idea of the Wilbur Combs matrix where he thinks that he's getting this pure phenomenological experience that isn't colored by his relative conditioning. And that would be incorrect. It's a pretty well established understanding, especially amongst postmodernists and postmodern plus thinkers, that your culture, the relative languages in which things come to us, affects the way that we see things. To just have one relative way of seeing things or one relative symbol set to be working with limits your perspective on reality. Let's go to the next one. He says, it's hard to know where to start in unpacking this. It's apparent that David sees the lower left as a filter because of the key role of language and culture in shaping our belief and ideas. Yes. However, the idea that this fact causes us in the end to have an incredibly limited perspective must be challenged. No. These are different factors. There's the inherently limited aspect of what it is to have a subjective perspective, and there's the limitation of relative symbols to be able to talk about our experience and the world in which we live. So there are two different types of limits. It's not that one causes the other, although words both hide and reveal aspects of the truth. It's not just an inherent limit, it's also a strength. It's our ability to use words as tools to be able to understand reality that have helped us to be able to have some kind of mastery over ourselves and the world that we live in. It has to do with the development of cognition, but it is still a type of conditioning. We still are only working with the tools that we have. But yeah, just the fact that we're a human and we live in this time, at this point in history, at this scale, we've only been to so many places, we only know so many languages, means we have an inherently limited perspective. Again, this is the point of the Wilbur Combs matrix, that our level of development and our cultural meaning matrix are going to shape the way that we translate our experience, because we only have our words and our language and our concepts to be able to make sense of what's going on. Back to it. To start with the idea that even arithmetic truths like 2 plus 2 equals 4 and presumably logical and mathematical ones are in some way epistemologically compromised by having to be expressed in language must surely be rejected. No, there is an important distinction to be made between objective facts and absolute truth. They are not one and the same. This is why your orange, rational, empirical reductionists are not speaking the absolute truth. They're playing a word game too. Now, it might be the most accurate word game, but there is an important distinction here to be made between the relative terms and the actual truth that it's pointing to. If we met an alien from another planet, they would probably have mathematics, but two plus two equals four is not something that they would understand. That's a human way of talking about it. And it very well might compromise our ability to see the absolute truth. Maybe if there was a different way of representing these symbols, it would also yield new insights that we haven't come across yet because we're limited by our symbol set. That's a totally possible, legit thing. So objective truth is not absolute truth, but if we agree upon the relative value of the symbols, then yes, it is a true fact. But there is an important distinction to be made between the map and the territory no matter how accurate your map. Back to it. Of all non-psychological truths, these are surely the most secure. You might even say the least relative, a sophisticated epistemology must accord them that status. I can see no reason to just bundle them in with cultural ideas and so forth. So he's implying a relativistic flatland where there isn't one. But look how he frames this. Of all the non-psychological truths, these are surely the most secure. Of all the non-psychological truths, these are surely the most secure. It's like he thinks that phenomenology is the best methodology. He seems to be implying that here. But this is where nested quadratic holarchies come into play. And yeah, definitely some truths are more reliable and accurate than others. And this would be something I would definitely want to add to a future epistemology 
video. This is one of the problems with integral methodological pluralism is that laying it out like that does tend to imply kind of a flatland where it's hard to know what kind of truth trumps what other truth and how reliable certain ones are. It does tell you what kind of methodology you need to use to get at what kind of data, but it doesn't tell you how to value different types of data or what data trumps what other data. This is where I think the nested quadratic holarchies help, and also where I think an idea about what we're calling tetravalidation or cross-quadrant validation or explanatory power basically comes in. And what we're talking about there is not just getting data from one quadrant and then building a case around that, but making a case for something as being the best form of explanatory power in general using data from all the quadrants. I mean, it's one thing if you have some amazing experience in your upper left quadrant or like some amazing personal experience, but if those ideas don't jive with what's happening in all the other quadrants, then it doesn't really have the explanatory power. It becomes a lot less convincing. But I agree that objective truths have a higher status than relative or subjective truths. But when we speak about objective or subjective truths, we are using relative symbol sets to express those truths. And if that's not a filter through which these ideas get ran through, I don't know what is. So this is an integral distinction. Speech is all relative, but some truths are more true than others. So certainly there are levels of truth and there are levels of certainty. All right, back to it. Furthermore, the very quick sketch given of how our experience of the objective reality is supposed to be mediated by the lower left filter raises many more very difficult questions than it answers. Other people are posited to exist in this objective reality, but apparently only accessible to us via sense information, which we process through the filter, which apparently limits our perspective despite the expansion resulting from the sense information. So again, it's not just limiting. He really doesn't like this idea of a limited perspective or having to filter your understanding through a relative lens. And as I've said, getting more sense information and relative data can expand your perspective. It can reveal new truths to you as well as hide things. That's the problem with having a way of talking about something, is that it does help you to understand it, but ultimately it can be a limiting understanding. It's like you could be taught a Christian worldview, and it's helpful to have a worldview, certainly more helpful to have a worldview than to not have a worldview, but there's inherent limits as well as conditioning embedded in that worldview that are gonna hide aspects of the truth as well as reveal aspects of the truth. You're gonna see the world differently. You're gonna see some things more clearly and other things not at all. He says other people are posited to exist in this objective reality. Does he not think that other people exist? Is he a solipsist? He doesn't think that other people exist? So I'm not exactly sure what flavor of idealist Keith is. Is he a solipsist? He, is he the more Buddhist kind of style idealist? I'm not sure exactly where he's coming from around this. To be clear, I think we can know that other people exist because of things like language and culture. And if you learn things from other people, then they probably don't just exist in your mind. If you had to learn something that you didn't previously know, then there's probably an objective reality out there and other people in it who know things that you don't know. Again, this is why explanatory power is good and why phenomenological reductionism is not a good methodology because it would only be on some phenomenological reductionism that you would get to this point where it's like, well, supposedly there are other people in an objective reality. Like if you doubt other people and an objective reality, then your methodology is incredibly limited and it's kind of ridiculous to even argue with you. He says, this sounds like a very poor exposition of what is known as phenomenalism, according to which all we ever know of the world is something called sense data, from which we construct all our knowledge, or at least all our knowledge of external reality. Phenomenalism was appropriately enough put forward by early 20th century logical positivists like Ernest Mach and A.J. Error. Not surprisingly, it raises, amongst other issues, the skeptical problem of how we actually know that others exist. Given that all we know, X hypothesis, hypothesis is the sense data. I would want to insist instead that what we actually perceive is the person themselves and that so-called sense data are an abstraction from that. But this is to digress somewhat, except that it points out that the big picture being painted is by no means the only possible or even the most plausible one. So this move of trying to say that I'm a reductionist is not a good move to make. 
and let me explain why. As I said in the beginning of this video, when I introduced the difference between idealists and realists, one of the things I said was, it's a difference in nesting, or an idea about primacy. To say that people who are realists don't believe in interiority is a ridiculous thing to say. It's a straw man that doesn't really help. It just makes it seem like you don't really know these people or what you're talking about. Like, how many people have you ever met in your life who say that they don't believe in love or don't believe in feelings or don't believe in interiorities at all? Come on. Who have you ever met? Ever. I mean, there are people who will say things sometimes, like, it's all just chemicals or something like that. Try to make themselves feel better. Try to make other people feel better. It's like a coping mechanism or something. None of these people actually don't believe in feelings. It's ridiculous. So to say that we're reductionist is ridiculous. And also, they're just as reductionist on the other side. If you want to say, oh, you think that all this is just happening in your mind, that's what they think. You see him in this note, not only calling into question whether reality exists, but whether other people exist. So this is that upper left quadrant reductionism that I'm talking about, where you start to wonder whether anything at all exists besides you, and you start to take that real seriously. Anyways. The reductionism accusation isn't a good one because idealism is just as reductionist as a realist perspective. They both just nest the one inside the other. So that's not really a good argument for one versus the other. Isn't it interesting that he goes from being like, oh, you're an empirical reductionist. Then he's like, oh, you're over glorifying the relative th factors. And now he's like, oh, you must be a phenomenological reductionist. It's like, dude, quit trying to squeeze me into a limited perspective. I'm clearly talking about an integral perspective. So of course we're going to include empirical factors, of course we're going to include the relativistic factors, and of course we're going to include the phenomenological factors. This is an integral view. So it takes into account the truths of all of these perspectives and methodologies. It's true in a way that all things are relative. It's true in a way that all things are subjective. And it's true in a way that all things are objective. They're all kind of true. But that's why you need to be able to talk about the strengths and limits and the ways in which each one of these things. It's true. This is also where we would use nested quadratic holarchies to tease apart the cosmology and the epistemology. So the cosmology and ontology has to do with the way that the quadrants emerge in time. In terms of epistemology, we do start off with a subjective perspective. And then we have relative filters and shared meanings through which we try to access things which are nested in a big picture context. But to get at those things, you have to go through these different levels to get at them. They're all still online. All science comes back to us talking about it using words and us still using our subjective perspective to try to get objective measurements. There's still peer review. All of these aspects are still online. So this is why I'm grateful to be making this video, because this is some stuff that I do need to expand upon further. And it is going to be important to get these upgrades. So he says here that we experience the person themselves. I would want to insist that instead what we actually perceive is the person themselves, and that the so-called sense data are an abstraction from that. Okay, how does that work? What even is the person themselves? This doesn't sound like a transpersonal or an existentially aware realization of what a self is. Self is a concept in the mind. So he thinks that you perceive the actual other person themselves. Has he ever had a friend? Does he think that when he's with them, that they really just see him for who he is? They just know his real self? No, they know a projection. They have a concept of who he is based on their limited experience with him and their way of understanding his role in their life. What kind of dad is he? What kind of child is he? What kind of a husband is he? Like, let's say we were going to set up a debate after this. If we Skype each other, am I going to see the real Keith Price? Are we going to really be with each other? Am I going to perceive the person himself? Or am I going to project onto him all this idea of he's a man who's interested in integral theory he wrote this criticism of me. He's got these kinds of new age perspectives and believes in idealism, and I'm critical of him. Am I going to see him as anything but my projection, especially if I'm just a regular person, you know, not a person who's interested in trying to see him as a real person and to be compassionate for him? Like, that's a practice that you have to work on. And even that is something that you have to favor and want. And even that is still a type of projection, a sympathetic view. 
So you try to keep all that stuff in mind. Maybe you have a really good projection, but at the end of the day, you still have a projection, a concept that you put on them and then you see how well they live up to it or not. And then that refines your perspective of them over time. But this is that kind of naive realism that I'm talking about. This is that kind of, well, I just perceive them as they are. And the so-called sense data are just abstractions from that. It's like, that's just like me trying to talk about it. It's just abstractions. But when I'm with them, that's pure experience. Like, no, dude, that is not how that works. That's not how experience works. There remains an assertion that we are dealing with the hermeneutic circle. Wikipedia explains that. Okay. So the hermeneutic circle describes the process of understanding a text hermeneutically. It refers to the idea that one's understanding of a text as a whole is established by reference to the individual parts and one's understanding of each individual part by reference to the whole. Neither the whole text nor any individual part can be understood without the reference to another, and hence it's a circle. However, this circular character of interpretation does not make it impossible to interpret a text. Rather, it stresses that the meaning of a text must be found within its cultural, historical, and literary context. Exactly. And the same thing can be said about a person's perspective, that it is context bound and embedded in its cultural, historical, and personal context. So that's a limited perspective. From this, it is apparent that to describe the basic epistemological situation of perceiving external reality in these terms is to say the least something of a stretch. Does the fact that we have to use language to convey our knowledge and understanding of reality to each other, at least beyond the very basic or instinctual modes, mean that we are mirrored in incredibly limited perspectives because of the cultural, historical, and literary context that we have to assume are not to be trustworthy? Hardly. Really? What do you mean hardly? I'm not saying that knowledge is not to be trusted. I'm saying there are limits to our perspective and we have to be careful and methodical to understand how to reliably get at truth and understand our strengths and limits. Pointing out the limits does not negate the value or certainty of all of our distinctions. So it's not to say that we can't know anything, but it is to say, yeah, that we only have relative knowledge. People think that philosophy is a waste of time because they take things like language for granted. They go, oh, well, language just describes what is, right? And it's like, no, it doesn't just describe what is. It shapes and limits the way that we are able to see reality. The psychologist George Herbert Mead talks about intersubjective linguistically mediated perspective taking and how basically our whole entire concept of a self is rooted in language and this kind of self-talk to itself about itself. And so our whole concept of a self is not only intersubjective through the lens of other people looking back at us constructed for them, but it's also based on all of this self-talk and concepts about ourself to ourself that helps us to be who we are. Language absolutely affects how we see reality. Not only do different languages give people different abilities, like for example, some languages build a compass into people, like direction built into their language, and they automatically always know which direction is which. They know where north is at all times. There are tonal languages where people have perfect pitch. And depending on whether you read right to left or left to right, or whether you are one of these directional language people, you might arrange linear pictures differently from left to right or right to left, or in a fixed way relative to the landscape. And some languages have masculine and feminine variations, like German and Spanish. And German and Spanish happen to flip some of the masculine and feminine and variations, for example, around things like sun and moon. One culture sees the sun as masculine and the other one sees it as feminine. So you have different ways of seeing the same thing. Like, for example, a bridge is seen to be feminine in one language and masculine in the other. If you ask people with these different languages to describe a bridge, the people who have the more feminine language are more likely to describe the bridge in feminine ways. Like, it's beautiful and it's connecting and it's elegant, versus people who have a masculine conception of the bridge who will describe it as powerful and strong and long and things like this. There are definitely many ways in which our language shapes the way that we see reality. So language definitely shapes our conception of reality and our conception of self. If you don't know that, then you're not really in touch with some of the basic realizations that come through existentialism and green postmodern philosophy. This isn't even getting into integral philosophy yet. This is just some of the important deconstruction work done at green. 
And yeah, it's important to reconstruct and reintegrate, but you have to actually break things down and deconstruct them before you can really do that. Otherwise, you end up getting it wrong and then having to go back and relearn things that you should have already known. All right, back to it. To start with, most perception does not lean on those contexts nearly so heavily or very much at all as textual interpretation. And it is in any case quite possible to examine the context used for any given interpretation and often provide a larger, more accurate version, which allows us to expand our perspectives. Good scholarship is doing this all the time. So we can say confidently that the epistemological pessimism expressed here is unwarranted. Well, you're fighting a straw man again here because basically you're thinking that I'm saying that nothing is trustworthy and that we basically have nothing. It's not pessimism, it's realism. Your overly negative read of what I'm saying here is the pessimism that is unwarranted. All right, there is an additional problem with the epistemological premise that, in my view, is fatal. It's not a problem unique to the kind of positivism that is espoused here, but typical of it nevertheless. It turns on decrying our cognitive facilities by tactically assuming a special insight, somehow not degraded by the factors that are supposed to degrade them. I quote from R.G. Collingwood as an exactly parallel criticism of subjective idealism, or in this case, positivism, is a kind of bomb-proof shelter in which to escape from criticism of their own conception of nature. For this, they say, is after only a conception framed by the human mind, which is notoriously limited faculties of comprehension and is only natural that such a conception should be found lacking in coherence. This is bad philosophy, for it implies that we both cannot transcend our own cognitive faculties, can transcend them, for otherwise we should be unable to recognize their limitations and their badness of the conclusions to which they lead us, and cannot transcend them, for otherwise we should be able to overcome the limitations and better the conclusions. R.G. Collingwood, The Idea of Nature. From this we should conclude that we are, in fact, always able to expand our perspective and gain greater insight into all sorts of aspects of reality, of all sorts of aspects of reality, as in fact we do all the time. To deny it makes an utter mystery of how we can even get a handle on our own failures to do so. Well, he's clearly fighting a straw man here. I'm not denying that we can have knowledge. I'm not denying that we can better our knowledge. I'm not the kind of reductionism he keeps on wanting to make me into. I'm just including multiple factors. He's just switching straw men and fighting different extreme positions. It has nothing to do with what I'm saying. I don't know what he means when he says we should conclude that we are in fact always able to expand our perspective and gain greater insight into all sorts of aspects of reality, as in fact we do all the time. I think that there are some things that we'll never be able to know, and I think that there are some things that we can probably get to the point where we know all that we can know about them. At the beginning, when he denies my first distinction about there being things that are unknowable, maybe this goes back to that, where he thinks that we can potentially know anything and we can continue to get more knowledge of everything. I don't know if either one of those things are true, but I would be open to an actual argument about those factors. All right, David's assertion that personal experience is not all that trustworthy is undue pessimism. He says this as a contrast to the peer review and reproducibility, which are, or at least should be, characteristic of scientific procedures and experiences. That science requires personal experience as part of the process, and that versions of scientific rigor are perfectly capable of being applied even to the most subjective experience, as Wilbur forcefully points out, he should know, as a student of integral philosophy, why is it that he fails to even mention it? The reason I don't mention explicitly this point, for one, is because it's unneeded extra information if I already say that we do science in all four quadrants. And two, I don't have some kind of agenda to make a case for my spiritual experience being confirmed by science. And the way Wilbur uses it doesn't actually end up being scientific because he doesn't actually have a good peer review there. His claims about Buddhism and whatnot fail peer review. You can't really have a religious community of the adequate because what will end up happening is that you have religious fundamentalist believers who will just say things like, oh, until you agree with me, you didn't get it right. Go try again, and then maybe you'll have an amazing experience, and then you'll agree with me and be mature like me. I mean, imagine, don't you think Christians would appeal to this kind of spiritual experience too? Like, look, not only have I had it, but there's a community of the adequate who also agree with me. We've all had these amazing experiences of love and Jesus in your heart and God speaking to our hearts. We can all agree about that. And if you don't agree that that's what it is when you have a worship experience, if you don't agree with our translation of that, it's just because you're not mature like us. So this community of the adequate ends up denying voices that don't agree with them. 
Like if the community of the adequate was just people who have had the same experiences and what they report, then the claims that he's making fails. The claims that these religious people are making would fail because not everybody would report that kind of translation. And again, this gets us back to the Wilbur Combs matrix and the understanding that your translation of any experience says more about you and your stage of development than it does about the truth of reality. Yeah, I think I've made a pretty good case so far as to why personal experience is not that trustworthy. And the case that he's made to say why it's the most trustworthy is not that convincing to me. Sure, it's good at letting us know that we exist, but in what other circumstance is it the most trustworthy or reliable type of methodology to apply to get at truth? It's a lame case for phenomenology. Yes, science is rooted in personal experience. We use our personal experience to make measurements and all that, but the point of peer review and trying to make these more objective measurements is to try and bypass the personal and cultural bias and find a more factually verified objective truth. So bringing up the fact that at bottom it's subjective is to try and create a false equivalency, which is to try to make more room for pseudoscience. After this, we get a mention of what ethnologists have discovered in experiments with pigeons. Apparently, they are superstitious, which puts me in mind of a remark about B.F. Skinner's work with pigeons, that it looks as if Skinner has proven that pigeons have freedom and dignity. Why should this have any bearing on people is totally unclear. What's unclear is how you've been able to miss the point here. Circular reasoning, causation correlation fallacies, and confirmation bias are the main patterns behind most superstitions, including Wilbur's and probably yours. Maybe if you learn about the patterns of superstition and the difference between real science and pseudoscience, you could outgrow some of your bad ideas. These are really important. Let me give an example. Ken Wilber's a Buddhist. He's initiated into Buddhist teachings, Buddhist philosophy. He's told about how to have a religious experience. He does his spiritual practice. He has a religious experience, and he translates it in the light of the spiritual teaching. This is that circular reasoning, and the causation correlation fallacy is the idea that because he's had this amazing experience, and it's correlated with the spiritual practice of the tradition, that then it proves it, and that's that confirmation bias. The confirmation bias goes on to where you tend to see things that validate your perspective and disregard things that contradict your perspective. And you only count the hits, you only count the good things. This is a totally different perspective than trying to falsify something and prove something wrong to see if it stands up. So usually pseudoscientists work backwards from ideas they like and then look for a bunch of things that will confirm it, all caught up in this circular reasoning, all caught up in this confirmation bias. This is how superstitions are born and persist. And recognizing these patterns in yourself and in others is how we can help to break these superstitious patterns. Then finally, we get some discussion of the lower right quadrant, that of objective systems or its. David has two takes on this. It's either big picture objective or absolute. As for the first, Wilbur makes it clear that as far as he's concerned, calling a lower right perspective holistic and claiming it gives the big picture is bogus because it ignores the inner dimensions of reality. Now we're back to the accusations of being a materialist. As an integralist, if we have a big picture view of reality, let's say integral theory, does this include interior dimensions of reality or no? It's the same straw man over and over again of saying I deny interior aspects of reality when we were just talking about all these aspects of reality. So how is he saying that they're left out? Maybe some people's big picture view doesn't include interiority, but if you're an integralist, it clearly does. And yeah, the absolute is in all four quadrants, not just the lower right. But again, if you're talking about the lower right being a systems perspective or a big picture view of everything, if your system is big enough to include everything, then it could be talking about the absolute. That being said, I do think it's more skillful to talk about the absolute in all four quadrants. I pretty clearly make this distinction in the video. Really, in a strict sense, you would want to draw a circle around all of this quadrants and say that it's all the absolute. But it seems like the lower right quadrant does include all the other quadrants because it's a systems theory and big picture theory quadrant, just to make that clear. It almost feels like this is Keith's first draft and that he didn't really put very much work into this. Like he just like watched my video and took some notes along with it and just heard what he wanted. Even after I clearly made distinctions, he still just keeps fighting the straw man that he wants to fight. As far as philosophy goes, this is more like propaganda, BS, hit piece, total misrepresentation than it is really dealing with any of my actual points. It looks as if David is setting himself against this as it seems to be a characterization of the lower right he prefers. 
I think I'm pretty explicitly talking about a view of reality that doesn't favor personal preferences. This guy just loves fighting a straw man. It's like desperate to try to get me. And in his desperation, he flails around, unable to get me, stabbing everywhere, hitting nothing and claiming victory. It seems clear to me that Wilbur was right. About what? Even if I'm wrong about everything, that doesn't do any work to support Wilbur's assertions about anything. This is a non sequitur and a false binary fallacy. And besides the additions that I've made to his map, Wilbur and I agree, and he's yet to show a way in which we don't agree. As for the idea that the lower right can be regarded as being about the absolute, this is obviously wrong. None of the quadrants can be so regarded, as they are all part of the map of relative reality. Yes, I agree with this. In future videos, after I made this first epistemology video, like in my video about Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris around their epistemology ideas, I do kind of a fast epistemology video, and I make this map versus territory and the absolute versus relative kind of distinction a little bit better there, where I don't talk about the absolute in terms of being in the lower right quadrant. So that is one of the things that I somewhat corrected early on. So there's truth in all four quadrants, but the map is not the territory. But if we're making a map to talk about where the absolute truth would be, the absolute truth is everything. If the lower right quadrant includes everything, then we might be tempted to talk about the absolute in terms of the lower right quadrant. Maybe not the best move, but definitely an understandable one. But this is where the understanding of factors at play are so important. Are we talking about facts, opinions, local symbols and stories? Are we talking about metaphors about human life or metaphors about a mystery beyond all categories of thought? Obviously, the the point of this epistemology video is not to create a flatland or to be reductionist, but to understand how all the parts relate to the whole and to be able to make nuanced distinctions about different types of truth. Insofar as we can talk with any usefulness about the absolute, we have to do it anyway, despite knowing ahead of time that anything we say cannot capture it, we might say that this is the source and ground of the entire relative reality that we are trying to map. Sure. Yeah, we definitely want to be able to make maps, and we want to be able to make good maps. This is the point of making this video. But we still do want to know that the map is not the territory. That's an important distinction that we're going to need to make if we're going to actually talk about truth. No one's saying we shouldn't make maps. That David mentions it in relation to a particular quadrant puts in question his understanding of the model, or at least his willingness to admit that his take on it is very different from Wilbur's. No, in this case you're fighting a straw man. Wilbur and I do agree that the absolute is in all four quadrants, but we do disagree on cosmology. So Wilbur and I tend to generally agree in terms of epistemology. Where we tend to disagree is around cosmology and ontology, and that's where we're going to disagree as well. As much as you want to say I am an exterior reductionist, he could be called an upper left quadrant reductionist. So really we disagree on what is primary and what is nested, though we mostly agree on how we could know. Yet he gives too much emphasis to upper left quadrant data and not enough value to data in other quadrants. So his conclusions fail to have cross quadrant validity or tetra validation. And this is why he has such a negative and unhealthy relationship to science as it is and academia as it is, because he basically takes a minority creationist position that most scientists disagree with. Before finishing, I want to mention a few more assertions made toward the end of the video. At one point, David asserts that a theory is a collection of facts. This is incorrect. A theory is, to put it maybe too shortly, a systematized explanation that is backed up by individual facts. Or not. Okay, here's the definition. A scientific theory is a well-sustained explanation of some aspect of the natural world based on a body of facts that have been repeatedly confirmed through observation and experiment. Such fact-supported theories are not guesses, but reliable accounts of the real world. So when he says that theories are based on facts or not, he's wrong. At least those are not valid scientific theories. This might seem like a small thing to mention, but it illustrates a tendency to sloppy thinking or at least expression that undermines credibility. So what I find to be pretty sloppy is that you can write all of this, pretty much fail to make a single point that is really critical of me, and you end up spending all of this time fighting a straw man and then patting yourself on the back for it pretty hard in the comments. Check the fallacy to point ratio, man. That is sloppy. All right, next point. 
Further on, he claims that idealism is narcissistic and based on felt experience and traditional lower left dogma. Yeah, most versions of it are. There's also these new age woo-woo types as well who want there to be other realms and magic powers and stuff like that. But yeah, most of it is Buddhist dogma or Christianity. So yeah, I probably should have cast a slightly bigger net and made a little bit more room in the idealistic camp. But I do think it's narcissistic because ultimately he thinks that these fringe group of people People who are desperately making a case for their preferences and him and his experience trump all the knowledge that thousands of people have built together over hundreds of years. The appeal to personal experience as trumping everything is narcissistic. So this is also the problem with some of this idealism is that it can kind of lead to a very narcissistic me-centered life where it's like all about me having my experiences and how do I deal with it? It's all about a test for me kind of thinking. Maybe nothing else even exists. It's definitely an overemphasis on the upper left quadrant which is even by Ken Wilber's definition a form of narcissism. Back to it. From this, one has to wonder how much idealistic philosophy he has actually read. A good amount. I'm pretty knowledgeable about philosophy and religious traditions. It's kind of my thing. I've been studying it for about two decades, so I'm generally pretty up to date on the philosophical conversation and the different points of view. I mean, I'm sure there's people I've missed and there's details that I could refine, but I get the basic idea. I get the story. I've read multiple versions of the idealistic versus materialistic themes, going back to your Plato's and Aristotle's, your Hegel's, your Marx, and we have the same theme even in Integral. Your Wilberians and the more realist and emergentist versions, my people. But again, it's always appeals to authority like this. Like, how much have you read? How much philosophy have you read? I've read a lot of people who agree with me. That must mean I'm really right or I feel really right. Well, that could just be a lot of confirmation bias. That's not an argument. That's an appeal to authority fallacy. Back to it. Even the notorious subjective idealism of Berkeley is much more philosophically rigorous and argument-based than this contents, and Hegel's objective idealism escapes altogether. You might and many do reject the arguments, but you cannot do so by pointing out an underground appeal to feelings or dogma. Come on, man. Can we really not say that there's a dogma influence when it comes to these idealistic philosophers that you're pointing at? Berkeley, Kant, Hegel, all the people that you mention are all Christians. Sure, people like Hegel are more like Gnostic Christians, but these are all people who are heavily influenced by religious Christian dogma. And so, yeah, they kind of have an idealistic bent. Don't act like, oh, these are just pure intellectuals. There's no kind of religious dogma or influence of religious wishful thinking. No, these are pure intellectuals. Come on. These are not people who have really existentially deconstructed their concepts about religion. They act like they're going to be really rational, but then they just make a really rational case for their god. So this stuff is not even really postmodern. It's not even really digging into some of the existential crises and, and whatnot. These people haven't really deconstructed their worldviews. They haven't really undone their fundamental assumptions, and that's part of the problematic nature of their whole worldview. It's built on these fundamentally religious assumptions about the nature of reality, and it's not actually a good case for how things work. Again, this wasn't a video made for philosophers, this was a video made for regular people. Next point. Finally, he asserts that consciousness is a byproduct of matter. This is known by systemic analysis, and materialism is a relative fact, which can't be reduced to empiricism. Notice, I said it can't be reduced to empiricism, and that it was known by systemic analysis, which means cross-validating multiple disciplines, and what's the best explanatory power? And yes, back then I was calling it materialism, now I would better make the distinction and call it emergentism, to better distinguish from empirical reductionism, even though here I explicitly said it can't be reduced to mere empiricism, and he quotes me. Here we actually finally get some quotes, which is very nice. And yes, these are things I explicitly said. Consciousness is a byproduct of matter. This is known by systemic analysis. We can correlate the emergence of phenomenon in the upper left quadrant to equipment in the upper right quadrant. You don't get capacities before you get the equipment. That's not how it works. The equipment allows for the capacities. So the one emerges from the other. It's emergent. So going back to this point about being sloppy, if he knows that I've said it's not reducible to empiricism. If he knows I introduce integral methodological pluralism, how come he spends the whole video trying to cram me into different reductionist straw man perspectives? 
what's the deal with that? How come he hasn't gone back and corrected his previous errors, which are clearly previous errors, and he thinks he hasn't misrepresented me? Yeah, right, come on. Okay, back to it. By systemic analysis, I presume he means brain scanning and simulation procedures, which have certainly established that there are some sorts of correlations between conscious experiences and various things going on in the brain. So this guy doesn't even think that consciousness is a byproduct of the brain. As I said, emergentism is the general accepted theory. Our knowledge of evolution disproves both the creation myth of Christianity and the creation myth of Buddhism. We have emergentism and we have evolution and these theories aren't going anywhere. These theories are validated across multiple disciplines. We have a clear and coherent story about the emergence of life on the planet. And whatever tiny gaps in our knowledge that we currently have are not big enough to cast doubt upon the whole project. So people like Keith will actually use the overall acceptance of our best theories against them to be like, this is a dogma. This has become a dogma. It's accepted by so many people. It's just taken for granted now. It's like, yeah, it's taken for granted because that's where all the explanatory power leads. And so instead of making a case for why his theory is the best theory, instead he ends up making a case against science, which we'll see soon because Keith has published the introduction and first chapter to his book, which are not that long. And we're going to see these themes again, the downplaying of science, his own version of reductionism, where he tries to reduce all versions of realism and materialism down to empirical reductionism, not really putting all of his cards immediately on the table, but basically casting doubt on the fact that reality exists and opening the possibility that there are other fields or spirit or something like this. These kinds of mystical woo-woo new agey ideas dressed up in scientific language with a dash of quantum physics in there for good measure. Because of course quantum physics disproves materialism, right? Yeah. All I wish to say here is that this by no means establishes that consciousness is a brain byproduct because correlation does not demonstrate causation in either direction and that there is other evidence that very seriously puts that in doubt. So he wants to dispute this and to say there's other evidence, but what other evidence? And then I'm sure he would point to pseudoscience. This is not disputed amongst the experts in these fields. The people who think these things are a fringe group of pseudoscientists and yeah, these old philosophers who try to sneak their religious ideas in through the back door. Okay, last point. As for materialism not being reducible to mere empiricism, I certainly agree, but insist that rather than being a relative fact, whatever that might amount to, it is, of course, a philosophical theory and stands and falls by its ability to withstand rigorous philosophical scrutiny. By that standard, as much current work in the field is progressively revealing, it is failing. A good reference is The Warning of Materialism, E.G.R. Coons. Read this book by someone who agrees with me. Then you'll be on my same page. It's like, no. And it doesn't rise and fall based on its ability to withstand rigorous philosophical scrutiny. It rises and falls on its ability to withstand scientific tests and to harmonize in a way that works with explanatory power. You can't just build yourself a nice little castle and be like, it stands. As if having something that works in a consistent way with itself makes it true. That's not how philosophy works. Science is the testing ground of philosophy. If your ideas aren't taken seriously amongst the majority in the relevant fields, then they're probably not good. That just stands to reason, doesn't it? So, in this whole talk, Keith brought up two good questions, I would say. Like, if someone just asked me, like, hey, what about this and this? I'd be like, you know what, that's a good question. I would say we got, like, a couple good questions, like around, like, how are you saying the quadrants fit into the upper right quadrant? That's kind of a good question. And like, what counts as good evidence? That's a good question. These issues around accuracy that have me bringing up nested quadratic holarchies and these different levels of accuracy and trustworthiness. Tetra validation as explanatory power. So all in all, I'm glad to have this talk. I don't really think that Keith has made a good case against anything I've said. I end up agreeing with him on a lot of the things that he's saying, and I think pretty much saying all those things in the video so this guy is just like fighting a straw man of his shadow all day long fighting it hard but like i said he did post a version of his book and it might be interesting to see if we can see these patterns in there we certainly will real quick we're going to take a look at the introduction and first chapter to keith's book that he put out on integral global 
I'll put a link down below, you can follow along. We're not gonna read the whole thing together. Basically, I've made a color-coded version of it, and I'm gonna walk you through his arguments and point to some of his key sentences. So basically, all these blocks in blue over here are equating science and realism and materialism and arguing against them. Of course, you got the copyright claims at the bottom and the top. This is fair use criticism. I'm not trying to make money off of his thing, obviously. So basically, I've color-coded some of the types of arguments. The green bits have to do with relativizing and creating a green flatland or a false equivalency. The orange bits are reference to philosophers. This blue bit is straw manning and reducing versions of materialism. But let's just go through it. In the introduction, he basically starts by creating this relative flatland of meaning and value, where he's just like, well, science and materialism and rationalism are just perspectives. A certain way or set of ways of thinking about the world as a whole has gained dominance. A set of assumptions about its truth, accompanied by dismissiveness of alternative views. Man, that's so mean of them. So he took a course in philosophy of mind, and now he is very much against materialism. He says it's profoundly wrong and is a disastrous point of view. Man, that would be such a disaster if people thought the world was real. Can you imagine that? You're going around in this dream world and you're taking things seriously. What a disaster. So what is materialism? The beginning of his first chapter. And this is his argument in blue. And basically he strawmans it and he says that materialists believe all that actually exists is matter. The assertion that matter is all there is, right? So that's the idea is that he's saying that materialists think that matter is all that there is, period. Notice here, he also says the doctrine of materialism. Two places it says doctrine of materialism and doctrine of realism. So this is what I was talking about, about reducing straw manning and dismissing science and trying to equate science and materialism as just another relative worldview or maybe some kind of religious doctrine. Also here, we're making an argument against science because, oh, it believes in things like atoms, and, well, we split the atoms, so science was wrong, even though this idea of atoms comes from pre-Socratic philosophy, like BC times, and it's like, see, science doesn't know, and now quantum theory proves that materialism is wrong. It's like, no, it doesn't. So this is the level of argument being made against science. See, science gets it wrong. Look how it was wrong about atoms. Quantum theory. Idealism. See, the view that what is really real is whatever the subject matter of the most basic scientific discipline conceived with what we experience as other than ourselves as observers. See, this is great writing right here. Clear, concise. You getting that? <laughs> The view that what is really real is whatever the subject matter of the most basic scientific discipline conceived with what we experience as other than ourselves as observers. See, this is great writing right here. Clear, concise. You getting that? No, you're not getting that. Basically, what he's saying in this poorly written sentence is that people take objective science more seriously than they take observed phenomenon. And he has a problem with this because he thinks it should be the other way around. All these points in red is where he starts to call into question the realness of reality. This is why scientism and realism is messed up, is reductionist, because it depends on the existence of absolute time and space and reality. Such a limit. Limited by reality. <laughs> Luckily, Keith's view is not limited to reality like some kind of reductionist, okay? So then in yellow, he goes on to do that move of uplifting phenomenology and trying to make a case for why your personal experience is objective. Where such distorting influences are absent, a person can be said to be objective in their judgments. And then he does have a little bit of a subclause underneath being like, a person always has emotions. So I don't know, maybe he's not even fully on board with the objectiveness of people's personal experience. So it's hard to tell. Again, the doctrine of realism. Materialists take matter to exist apart from any kind of mental thing or process. Imagine that. His most reasonable statement is this idea that we should consider that both interiors and exteriors are both real in their own way. But then he immediately dips back down. You could, though, also consider whether anything at all truly exists outside of the mind. So there you go, back into the denial of realism. Materialism asserts, or frequently just assumes, that this is the case, that things exist. But there are, in fact, good reasons to doubt it. And then he brings up his favorite philosophers, Berkeley, Kant, and Hegel, who we know are Christians, cast more doubt on the world and says that basically all materialists are reductionists, and it's a difficult position to argue that you're not a reductionist if you're a materialist. Down here in purple, he makes a distinction between supernatural entities or realms and things like gods and heavens and angels and demons and fairies and pixies as if it's like, okay, that stuff is kind of crazy. 
but there could be some supernatural realms and psychic powers and all this stuff. We know he likes that kind of stuff. And here's the word doctrine again. I missed that one. That all causes are natural. So here he rejects the natural. So this is basically Keith's opening argument for idealism is just to kind of assert it to create this false equivalency to put down science and materialism and rationality and to offer up idealism as a viable alternative backed up by a couple of philosophers. And quantum theory, not the best case as far as I'm concerned. So I can kind of already hear Keith objecting and being like, I'm not saying I'm against science, I'm saying I'm against the materialist perversion of science. But you know what? Keith's ideas about science are a straw man and a perversion of science. Also, it's interesting that around things like facts and theories and objective, there are problems. This is not a good sign. When we can't get facts and theories and objective right, then we probably don't really have a good grasp on science. There's a difference between truth and facts. Things that get validated through a scientific process are facts. I don't know if we can really say that our experience of something can be said to be objective. That's why we have a peer review process. That's why we have falsification and validation and stuff like that. And the way he's like, theories can be accurate or valid or not, it's like, now he's kind of being like, oh, theories. Which, you know, some theories are very hypothetical and some theories are a lot more solid. So there's certainly a distinction to be made between valid and well-established theories and theories that are closer to the hypothetical, theoretical side. There's a potential problem in the way that he understands all of these things, which allow for some fuzziness and slipperiness so that way he can end up making a case for the things that he likes. And real science is actually a lot more rigorous than the pseudoscience that Keith ends up favoring. So he'll claim like he's very scientific, but he's clearly working backwards from his bias on this thing. Like nobody who takes an objective, open-minded view goes in and goes, hmm, yeah, this psychic powers and these morphogenetic fields seems really like it has the best explanatory power. These kinds of powers would be so easy to prove if they were actually true. And there are people who have had ongoing prizes available to anybody who can demonstrate that they're true. And a lot of what passes as science from these pseudoscientists, well-established pseudoscientists, if you go look at any rational or skeptical dictionary categorizing the different criticisms against different things, they will all tell you that these guys are pseudoscientists who cook the books, who work backwards from their ideas, whose tests aren't even really scientific for the most part as much as they're trying to figure out a way to make a case for these ideas. And in the ways that they do try to make a case for them, they're flimsy cases at best. And in the ways that they are peer-reviewed, when they do actually come up with real peer-reviewed tests, they fail. These ideas aren't taken seriously in science. Psychic powers would be like the easiest thing in the world to demonstrate if it was true and no one has ever been able to do it in a way that satisfies these programs who have publicly put money on the table. If a person really demonstrated and was like, pay me, you gotta know that not only would it change the world, but they would get paid. But no one can for real legit demonstrate this stuff under any kind of reasonable conditions. You think that all of this is happening in mind, but I've never seen a disembodied consciousness anywhere. How does that work? Where is this mind? Is it just like God's perspective, like we're talking about like Vishnu, like the sleeping God whose dream is the universe or something like that? Like is God gonna wake up and then all of this universe ends? So where is God? Where is the dreamer? Is it a brain in a vat as Descartes might have thought of it? Is this the matrix? Are we in Plato's cave right now? It depends on what flavor of idealism you're working with. For example, Ken Wilber's Buddhist idealism is very different than Steve McIntosh's Christian idealism, even though they're both idealists. If you think that the world is just arising in your consciousness, then you can tend to think that social problems or problems in the environment don't matter as much because they're just like figments of your imagination or delusions and that none of this is real anyways kind of thinking. And it also kind of allows for these ideas around magical powers and psychic powers and things like this. For this to be convincing to me, I want to see it built from nothing. Not just trying to poke holes in science, create this kind of false equivalency, and then offer your thing as an alternative. I want to see a good case with good logic made from the beginning with good explanatory power to support this view. That would be impressive to me. Like, how do you arrive at this conclusion from nothing? How do you get from, I think, therefore I am, to, I believe in idealism? No one's coming to this conclusion based on real science. People come to this conclusion because they want to believe that it's true. 
Now, another important distinction that I'm going to want to make here is that emergentism is not a claim about the absolute truth of reality. Emergentism is an objective claim about what we know in objective reality. I'm a hard agnostic when it comes to the absolute. I don't make claims beyond my ability to know. This could very well be a simulation. There very well could be a god up there somewhere. As far as I can tell, though, there's no good reason to think that that's the case. If there is some kind of god, he doesn't seem to intercede. If this is some kind of simulation, it still seems to be operating by some pretty strict objective rules. So I don't think we could make claims like we know that it's a simulation or, or that we know that there's a god. Coming to those conclusions is unfounded. I kind of think that the universe just recycles and that there's probably nothing transcendent, but I don't know. I wouldn't pretend to know or claim like I know. And that's the problem with idealism, is that it's pretending to know some stuff that nobody really knows. It's it's qualifying the unqualifiable, it's making claims about the absolute truth of reality, it's a pre-trans fallacy, it overglorifies upper left quadrant data, and it doesn't give enough recognition to the data in other quadrants. It's overstepping its bounds, it leads to bad ethical decisions, and honestly, it is not in accord with a healthy integral perspective. It needs to be outgrown. So let's talk about idealism and materialism developmentally real quick. Basically, historically and culturally, pre-rational worldviews are idealistic. They believe in gods and spirit and spiritual realms and magic and all kinds of stuff. Basically, realism comes online with rationality and science, and that's why they're connected. If you think about how long in history the traditional stage of development was the dominant stage, the orange modern rational stage came online, but it never really fully came into dominance. A lot of people are really good at being achievers to be able to make it in the world. But people have been struggling and striving to make it for a long time. That goes all the way back to our survival instinct. But not a lot of people have really fully grown up into a rational perspective or really had a full understanding of how science and logic and all of these things work. People have a very vague surface understanding of these things. So rationalism is not even around that long. It doesn't even take that much of a hold on the world and the people in it. Most people are still traditional. Even now, something like 70% of the world's population is traditional. And now we have postmodernism online, which is another huge group, and they're both critical of the rational modern stage of development. I'm hoping that with the integral stage that we can bring a lot of those rational values back online, but we're going to have to do a lot of work to do it because even a lot of people in our community still need to go back and learn these basic tools at Orange. And that's why, even though at integral, we're trying to integrate diversity with discernment, but still the discernment's not good. People still need to go back and learn these basic tools of rationality and logic. And you can hear it in the lay definitions that you get from Keith about what it means to have a fact or what it means to be objective or what it means to have a theory. He does not understand science. And he's not the exception. Unfortunately, in the integral community, it's a common theme. And it's the rule in general. Most people are not rational. Most people do not understand the basic tools of logic and rationality. So one of the major consequences of this is that we live in a modern and postmodern world for the most part. We have all kinds of awesome technology that rationality has brought to the table. So most people benefit greatly from rationality and from reason and from logic and from science and all of these things, but most people are completely disconnected and unappreciative of the kinds of processes that bring us these things. For example, Keith is typing out this criticism of my video on the Integral Global webpage with his computer or his phone, basically trying to advocate for this idea that reality isn't real and that objective science isn't that trustworthy, using the tools produced by science and rationality in a context to try and argue against those things. One of the major themes that I always feel like is important to touch when talking about the problems with idealism is that it gives people an unhealthy relationship to reality. It can manifest as a general disconnection, and it can also manifest as a downplaying of science and the value that that brings. The natural world, our biology, our brain, and how things work, all this stuff is undercut and just called an illusion. This is not a healthy view of reality. It undercuts what's real. It disassociates us from our everyday experience. So a lot of the philosophers who talk about idealism are on the cusp 
they are late traditional, late blue, early rational. So you have people like Berkeley and Kant and Descartes and Hegel, and they're all kind of rationalizing their pre-rational ideas. Someone like Plato is post-conventional in a traditional time, so he's also on the cusp, late blue, early orange, historically. So my point here is that the rational cases for idealism are just rationalized versions of traditional thinking. And then when these ideas reoccur around postmodernism, at Green they sort of have a resurgence because there is an antithetical reaction to rationality and science and materialism, and the interior quadrants come back online. So there's sort of an antithetical extremism that's happening where you swing from materialism hard back towards idealism. So these ideas around Buddhism and Plato, they metaphorically resonate with real things that postmodernists are realizing. Like postmodernists are deconstructing the fact that society is a relative game. And so it does feel like they're in a matrix. But it's not that reality itself is a matrix, it's that culture is a type of matrix. The way that we understand the world, that we translate the world, is a type of matrix that we're awakening out of. So I think what happens at Green is there's a lot of pre-trans confusion. At Green we start to reintegrate pre-rational symbolism and language in a more trans-rational way. So there are valid trans-rational ways of talking about this awakening, but what happens is is that they get confused with old-fashioned ways of thinking a lot. And so as these ideas get up into integral, they go from being pre-trans confusions to pre-trans fallacy number two, where we try to elevate ideas about God or dogma about creation myths or try to sneak in magic powers. These are all pre-rational, childish things that people are trying to sneak in as if they're reasonable and rational by appealing to science, even though they're strawmanning science, like appealing to quantum physics, which is science, to try and talk trash about science, or appealing to the rational philosophers who are trying to sneak in God through the back door. But at integral stages, we should know better. If we're really trans-rational, we integrate diversity with discernment, we have rationality fully online, and we can understand the symbolic and metaphoric poetic value of pre-rational symbols while also being able to separate the baby from the dirty bathwater. A lot of integralists are still working on trying to get this right, but I think when you really dig into idealism, it doesn't stand up well. It's not well-founded as an idea. It seems like it's either God or some magical powers or some kind of stuff that people are trying to sneak in, they're desperate to believe in, and a lot of it comes back to a desire to feel special and a lack of responsibility, hoping that the universe has a plan or God has a plan and I don't actually have to step up and do it, or that once I get the magical powers that things will just fall into place. People have a hard time of accepting the fact that there's no ultimate absolute thing out there that cares about us, that it's really up to us and we aren't going to have anything but our own selves and human nature to be able to pull it off. We're not going to have any powers and we're not going to have anybody who's going to come save us. A lot of these people need to get out of fantasy land, transcend their personal egos and their personal biases, and get real and get responsible. On the other side of the integral stage of development is an integrally informed stage of development, where we're not just trying to have an integral practice for ourselves, but we're trying to build systematic new ways of living together. And if your bias gets in at that point, you're not just messing it up for you, you're messing it up for other people and setting up systems that other people are going to have to deconstruct and reconstruct to make healthy in the future. Getting it right really matters. That's why I'm glad to talk about this stuff today. Thanks so much, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Keith, for your engagement. If you don't think I have a bias and that I'm just interested in trying to figure out what's true and good, smash like. If you think I got a bias or I'm some kind of a jerk, go ahead and smash the dislike. And both of you guys, let me hear about it in the comments. Let me know what you think about this video, if you like this kind of thing. If you're new here, make sure you subscribe and ring my bell. Buy the awesome Davidian Integral merch, get your 1K merch, support me on Patreon, I could really use the support. Big thanks to all my current Patreons, much love, I'll see you next time, peace!